my Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for. Lord Jesus, it's good to be in your presence in this Easter season. And our Father, St. Jose Maria, encouraged us and many saints also to use our imagination to put ourselves into the shoes and the minds and the hearts of the people who were there. And the Holy Spirit helps us with this in um, the Gospel of John. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And our father would focus on the fact that these two other disciples are anonymous. Their names are not mentioned. And he saw that as an opening for himself and for us. That we don't have to steal someone's identity to be there. We can just assume the identity of these NPCs, as they say, in the gaming world. And we imagine that it was um, such an exciting time, a time filled with joy. They knew our Lord was alive and that, therefore, his claims about himself were true. And it opened up a great future of hope, optimism. Jesus is alive. He's not dead. And he's radically powerful. He appears here, he disappears, he looks like a guy just on the road and the disciples going to a mouse can't recognize him. He looks like the gardener, passes through walls, disappears. He's got wounds in his hands and his feet and his side, and yet he's not in pain. An amazing thing. The power of the resurrection, Lord, the power of your personality, your person, in this glorious state, this glorious form. And so we can imagine that if we're like among the closer disciples of our Lord, just outside of the group of the apostles, we'd be excited about seeing Jesus in the resurrection. We'd be anxious to see him. We'd be hopeful to see him. Well, he appeared to me. He appeared appeared to Clopas and the other guy. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to 500 at one time. Will he appear to me? And maybe we'd be angling. Like, well, I'm going to really stay close to St. Peter because I'm sure our Lord has got something to say to him. And so St. Peter's walking around for those days and we're kind of like following him around. He's like, leave me alone. Get away from me. What are you doing here? Uh, no, I'm, I'm okay. Just, do you need anything, Peter? And Lord, now we have the resurrection permanently. You are always here. Our Lord doesn't pass through walls. He passes through time and space and passes through the appearance of bread and wine, to be in the Eucharist. To be in the Eucharist. This is my body. And so to go, Lord, where you appear is just to go to Mass. At every Mass, we have an appearance, a reappearance of the same resurrected Lord. We're in these scenes. And to be, Lord, where you are, perhaps... Sometimes those disciples were coming to be with the apostles, coming to be closer to the others. And when they get there, our Lord had already appeared. And he had been there a while, and he's talking to them. And, and there we are, 
But we walk into that room and he's already there. And we say, Jesus, Lord, what will we say? It's so good to see you. And that's the tabernacle. When we come into the into your presence, Lord, when that vigil lamp is on, we're walking into a scene where you're already there in the resurrection. Then we say, Jesus, Lord, it's so good to see you. Thank you for being here with us. This is my body. There's only one body of Christ. The body that ascended into heaven is the mystical body of the church. The body that rose from the tomb is the body hidden under the appearances of bread in the tabernacle. And that body, once resurrected, is always resurrected. We are witnesses of the resurrection, Lord, with our faith, with our faith, when we gaze upon the tabernacle, we know that you're in there in that ciborium, when we gaze upon you lifted up in the consecration, or lifted up in benediction, or in the monstrance. We're witnesses of the resurrection. Some Writers put it this way. They say there's no bread left. When the words of consecration are said, there's no bread left. There's not any bread anymore. It's just the appearances of bread. The whole thing is Christ. Which some people need to be reminded of. I was at a Christmas Eve mass this year helping a friend big parish, and I had the quote-unquote overflow mass in the parish hall, and there were still like hundreds of people there, three or four hundred people packed. And we got to the preparation of the gifts, and they had, they had three saboria there, and only two of them had hosts in it. And it was clear that this is, this is a, a shortage I'm in trouble unless something happens. So I turned to one of the B-team servers because he gave me the B-team on every, it was more like the C-team on everything. They were overwhelmed by the situation. They kept saying, Father, I've never served Christmas Mass before. Like, it's the same Mass. Do your job. I said, are there any more hosts and they were bewildered looking around the, the side rooms by the makeshift altar in the parish hall, which was, it was well done. And they couldn't find any. And so I said, okay, run over to the church and get some hosts. Make haste. And I think they would have made it were it not for this kindly old lady who was also helping. And she said, oh, Father, I'll I'll take them over. And I didn't have the wherewithal to say, no, you stay here. You run. Because this lady was not moving fast. And so I'm trying to go slow, but they're not coming back. And then I'm in the consecration And I noticed that they're walking up the makeshift aisle of the church with a box, unwrapped box, hosts. And I'm like, I don't think I can consecrate those from here. I don't think that would be right because they're not on the altar. And I can't just like, maybe I could. It's a sacramental question for sacramental theology. Like shift my attention. consecrate the host in the box. But I, I, you know, quickly decide I'm not going to do that. That would be terrible. And so we're giving out communion. And of course, we run, we run out. At which point, at two points in the process, one of these helpers said, Father, why don't you use the ones we brought? I said, they're not consecrated but Father, why don't you, we have some more over here. We just brought them. We can't use those, 
right? They're just bread. And if they were on the altar, right, they wouldn't be bread. There's no bread left. It's just the body of Christ. And the body, Lord, has your blood in it, and the body is alive because it's a resurrected body. And the body is enlivened by your soul. And your soul and your body, your humanity, has been assumed by the divinity. And so we say in that phrase that summarizes the the doctrine of the church from the Council of Trent, that in the blessed sacrament, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Easy access, Lord. We don't have to hope that you'll come. We don't have to tag along with other people who are more important than we are. We don't have to even pray for it in a certain sense. We just show up and we know that you're going to appear at the consecration and that you're going to remain in the host. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Lord, we know that you speak to us from the tabernacle, but it takes faith and perseverance and dedication to hear you. And if we could hear you speak, Lord, in this fully human form, now the appearances of your humanity are also hidden. But if we had the appearance of your humanity, Lord, and you could talk to us with your human voice, What would you ask us? What would you say to us? He tells them, do this. First, he asks them, have you any, have you any fish? How's it going? How you doing? And what you're doing right now? Bad. No fish. And then he says, well, do this. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Well, Lord, if you ask me that about my prayer, how's it going? Or my work? This is their work. How's it going at work? How you doing? Or my friendships, my family life. Do you have any fish? Lent is over. Do you have any steak? Or my struggle in that virtue that, I, that I'm trying to make headway in. How's it going? How are the fruits? Are you doing okay? And maybe, Lord, in all those areas, at least in, in some respect, we have to say no. No, my prayer is not going as well as it should be, or at least in my estimation, It could be better. I could make a better effort. I could be more recollected in my prayer and perhaps habitually so that the prayer is easier. It's primed by my presence of God. Or my work, Lord, no, I'm a little bit sloppy and disorganized and put things off that I find more difficult. I'm avoiding that that challenge or that difficult conversation that I need to have with someone. Or my relationships, perhaps, Lord, I have to say, no. I'm trying, Lord, but but this person's difficult, that person's difficult. And instead of owning it and working on it with peace and patience and acceptance, I lose my peace and I avoid or get angry or whatever. Our Lord wants to know, how how are you doing? Do you have any fish? And then after that, Lord, we say, no. He says, well, do this, right? Don't, don't get frustrated. Don't give up. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? What would you say to us, Lord? What would your advice be to us? What, what would his words be to us? Well, it depends on where we are, who we are. Maybe he would say, have more faith, right? Trust me more. Believe. Believe in the church. 
Believe in your vocation. Believe in my presence in your life. Believe that it's real. Nothing is truer than this word of truth, Aquinas writes in the adored he devoted we sang so many times in adoration. I believe all that the Son of God has said. Nothing is truer than this word of truth. And one of the things you tell us, Lord, is that the church is yours and her teaching is firm and that you're present here with us always. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Maybe that's what he would have to tell us. Trust me more. Have more faith. Believe in the church and all her teachings and go for it. Go for it. It was so beautiful at the Easter Vigil. I don't have the words memorized, but if you're coming into the church and you haven't been baptized in the church, so if you're baptized, you just get baptized and then receive confirmation and communion. But if you've been a Christian before and you're coming into the church, you have to publicly profess your faith in the church and her teachings. And they all say in front of everyone something like, I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church believes and professes to be revealed by God or be, to be taught by God. It's a powerful statement, uh, and it's helpful for us. Lord, I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church believes and professes to be revealed by God or taught by God. And that covers such a wide range of things, right? Everything from the Immaculate Conception to the primacy of St. Peter and the role of the Pope in the Church to the teachings on marriage to the sacraments. It's a lot to believe. And why do we believe it, Lord? Well, because nothing is truer than this word of truth because you told us that you want us to believe it all. Maybe, Lord, you would look at me and say, charity, right? Charity, charity. And remind me of what our Father wrote, that that understanding is the greater part of charity. More than giving. Maybe, Lord, there's some people in my life, I'm just like, how do I, I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about putting some holy water in their milk to see what happens, right? Because I'm, I got a suspicion that maybe they're possessed or something like this. My brothers went to Catholic school. I didn't. In grade school, they were younger than me by 16 months, they're twins. And they tell the story of coming in from recess into the classroom and they were in sixth or seventh grade or something like this. And the nun, we still had nuns back then in the schools. <laughs> the older nun was hiding behind the door. And as they came in, she started sprinkling holy water on them with aspirations in Latin. And the, the devious boys reacted by pretending to shrivel up and saying, it burns, sister, stop, it burns. Poor nun. Well, Lord, charity, right? The balm of charity. Patient, kind. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Maybe, Lord, when you talk to me, You'd have to tell me a parable. It's like, oh, you're here? Okay, Whew, this is going to take a story. Um, yeah, two guys were in the temple. <laughs> One was a tax collector. The other was a Pharisee. <clears throat> and he thought he was better than the other guy. And, um, and the other guy was closer to God, even though he was externally worse. Maybe, Lord, I need to hear that story because I'm hypocritical and I look down on others and I puff myself up and I mistake your gifts for my own merit. 
What would our Lord tell us? What is our Lord telling us? Children, have you any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes for he was stripped for work and sprang into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Beautiful details of the gospel. How John, Lord, wouldn't use his name, but claimed the title for himself of the beloved disciple, that disciple whom Jesus loved. With the sensitivity, Lord, of his young and pure heart, He was more receptive to your friendship, more open to your charity, more dependent on you because he had given up more from a young age. He didn't have a wife. More dependent, Lord, on your friendship for everything. And you reciprocated to that need with a special affection for him that disciple whom Jesus loved, and love sees, it is the Lord. He's the first one to see it. I mean, the other ones probably could have figured it out. Okay, it's a miraculous catch. (laughs) Jesus told us to meet us here in Galilee. It's probably him. But John sees it first and proclaims it. It is the Lord. Love is not blind. Love gazes. Love sees. The saints teach us, I don't think it's church teaching anywhere, but, you know, it makes a lot of sense. That if we were the only one that had to be redeemed, our Lord would have suffered everything just for one soul. Just for us that he doesn't redeem humanity en masse, or it's not a calculation. Okay, there's going to be 1.5 trillion people from now until the end of time. So I guess, yeah, okay, I guess I'll do it. No, it's like, I've called you my friends. I've called you my friends. Greater love has no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friend. And so each of those disciples, I mean... John's gospel probably wasn't distributed or written even until after all the other apostles were dead. But had it been, I think some of them would have been like, hey, wait a second, John. I'm the beloved disciple. You're not the beloved disciple. What are you talking about? That they all had this sense that they were special to our Lord. God only knows how to have only children. I read somewhere. Which makes sense, Lord, because you are the only begotten Son of God. You are the only begotten Son of God. And so when God loves me, he loves you and me. And you are his only child. I heard a story of a priest who remembers growing up that every night before he went to bed, his mother told him, You know, you're my favorite. I love you very much. You're my favorite. And he grew up and his mother was older and he was thinking about that. And so he figured she must have told that. She must have told that to everyone. And so he polled his brothers and sisters in conversations and said, you know, mom used to say this to me that I was her favorite before I went to bed. Did he, did she say that to you? And they're like, no. And so he went to his mother and said, Mom, I remember growing up before I went to bed and you were talking to me and you used to tell me, you're my favorite. I, I love you very much. She's like, yeah. It's like, 
why did you say that to me and not to the others? And she said, well, because you were the ugliest. <laughs> but that's very beautiful, right? It's like, it's very deep, actually, and very beautiful. It sounds mean, but it's not mean. And she knew that he would probably need more love and affirmation. And so she gave it to him. And this is, this is how God is with us, that he loves us as sinners or as we are. Not because of our merits or who we are, who we make ourselves to be, but because we're his. And the more needy we are, well, the more, in a certain sense, he has to love us. It's like, well, John needed him more. Because he was younger, because he was less experienced, because he hadn't, like, established an identity in life yet outside of our Lord. John needed him more. And so our Lord had to love him in a different way. And John knew it. And Lord, we're the, you know, we're your ugly children. We need you more. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. Come and have breakfast. Right? Words of the only begotten Son of God. Inviting them to eat, to have breakfast. A breakfast, Lord, that you prepared for them. What a wonderful icon of holiness in ordinary life, in family life, in small details. Come and have breakfast. And Jesus, you're waiting, you're waiting for us in our ordinary life. And so you say, come and have breakfast or come, let's go to work. And come and let's take care of these people. Come and let's work on this thing together. Come and have breakfast with me. Come and live your life with me. Come and have breakfast, a beautiful icon of holiness, Lord, right where we are, whatever's happening. It would also make a great Episcopal motto. I'm into collecting Episcopal mottos for people. Kill and eat is another one of my, another one of my favorites. Yom Fetid, right? He already stinks. That would be, that would be a good one. Just throw people off, you know. See if the Vatican objects. We go to Our Lady. How many times Our Lady said this to our Lord? Hey, come and have breakfast. Right? Or come and have lunch. Or come and have dinner. Right? Inviting him into the family life that they had together. And so we can stay close to her, right? To be with our Lord. Right? Perhaps many disciples were bumming around the apostles' those days as we considered before well the shortcut is our lady right wherever she is he is and so whatever we're doing let's stay very close to our mother the queen of heaven i thank you my god for the good resolutions affections and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation i ask your help to put them into effect my immaculate mother saint joseph my father and lord my guardian angel intercede for me